Well, we're back again, boys and girls, and this time we're at the uh, back of the vehicle, and um, I got Jordan here again. We're going to be talking, or he's going to be talking about what's going on with the, uh, the rear suspension. <clears throat> and you can see that this module all comes out in one big lump. Um, the motors and the, uh, the gearbox are there. Um, and this basically would be brought up in one felled swoop into the, um, into the, rear, of the, uh, the rear of the vehicle so that all the stuff could be attached. The other thing that we were looking at was, uh, we were just finishing up, looking at the, the different grades of aluminum. So uh, Jordan's going to point out the different, uh, the different types of aluminum. This isn't all the same material. It's aluminum, but it's like saying plastic. There's no such thing as plastic, and there's really no such thing as aluminum. You want to know what grade it is. Some are 5,000, some are 6,000, some are 300, some are whatever. So anyway, Jordan's going to explain all this stuff when we're walking through the... Um, <clears throat> walking through this. So first thing I, I noticed when I when I looked at this, uh, the five bar linkage, I um, I really like that from a, from a ride characteristic standpoint. Um, this is something that you see on all really good luxury vehicles. So. Yeah, and it's something that they uh, they change relative to the first one. So if you looked at the first Model S and you looked under here, you would have seen a, you could you could argue four bar, but really it's three hard suspension linkages. So they had a sand cast lower that did the, the job of uh, their two lower links. And then they only had two uppers on the, the original Model S. So they added a third link. They've got a dedicated toe link and they went to all forged arms. So it's a, a 6000 series forged aluminum arms and aluminum knuckle. So um, they increased their strength, they got better characteristics, and uh, <laughs> just kind of a side note, looking at this toe link, they use kind of like a turnbuckle or jam nut style, similar to what you'd see on a, a tie rod for a steering system for their adjustment. Um, so that's great from an installation perspective because when you're mounting this link, you can go straight in from the outboard side of the vehicle in the Y-axis and you don't have to worry about mounting up an eccentric bolt or anything like that for your adjustment. You're doing that all on the turnbuckle setup. Mm. So just kind of an interesting note there. But overall, they changed a lot. If you were to look at the, uh, the original Model S in comparison to this one, you wouldn't even think they were off the same vehicle. So the original Model S um, had extrusions Sim similar to the what we saw in the front cradle had extrusions running cross car that were mounted to uh, sand castings that kind of swooped up and over to to catch their upper control arm link um, and went fore aft to the uh, the trailing end of the cradle and then in the back they had another aluminum extrusion in this case uh, we saw i believe this was a 3000 series cast aluminum lower so the primary cradle or subframe is a 3000 series cast aluminum and then on the top they added an entirely new casting or or monument in this whole assembly that was not even on the previous generation so this is a 5000 series die cast aluminum piece and this is taking up the job of managing their uh their upper camber link so they're mounting their camber link directly into that upper casting. And there's something that we refer to when we're talking about uh, dynamics, when we're looking at a CAA model, and it's torsional hoops. So by creating this giant hoop around the powertrain, it, it really helps you manage all of the torque that's generated via the powertrain, as well as the suspension input loads that you're getting side to side, as well as in jounce and rebound. So, this architecture on, on the entire rear subframe is going to be extremely rigid um, and allow you to tune your suspension really well. The stiffer all of this is and, and the more consistent your structure is that you're mounting to, the easier it's going to be to tune your suspension and the better characteristics you're going to observe as the driver. So, um, and man, what a, what a packaging uh, symphony like mm. all the things that are going in here the coolant lines the PIA or part and assembly inverters two separate motors two mirrored gearboxes all encapsulated in that structure 
it may just kind of look simple or cool, but I, it is. There's a lot of engineering and cross-functional teams that I would <clears throat> bet every last dollar spent a lot of time going through, making sure that every line had its home, making sure that where needed, right, local application of abrasion wrap um, is applied and everything looks really tight. It looks tight and it looks engineered. And again, <clears throat> people have asked, uh, asked me about uh, the model S plaid and is it really what it is, uh, you know, what, what it's claiming to be. And I mean, you just look at this, who's got anything like this? Nobody. So I'm, I'm, very, uh, I'm very impressed, hugely impressed with what I've seen and heard. Um, I never worked on, uh, on the S or the uh, X before. Um, so that's why Jordan's here helping us out. But w w what do you think of the difference between this and the other one? I, I think it is almost an entirely new generation of vehicle. I think they are leaps and bounds where they were on the first one. And I think that uh, they've done a lot of things to really establish themselves as a legitimate automotive OEM. And then in some cases beyond that, right? There's very few companies or examples of subsystems like this where we're seeing this much cross-functional integration. Yeah. And that's outstanding. That's something that we here at Monroe when working with an OEM uh, really try and encourage and we have processes to help execute those types of engineering executions. Um, so, I, you know, great job. I think basically that um, what we're looking at is um, <clears throat> is a culture that is uh, nobody else has. Yeah. I mean, I worked uh, for almost every big OEM on the planet, and um, and I can tell you, it doesn't matter whether you're in Germany or Japan or or here in the United States, cranking out something like this where you're crossing party lines continuously. I mean, at the end of the day. Everything's politics inside of a, inside of an engineering department, and when you start moving away from I'm in structures and I'm in uh, uh, pneumatics or hydraulics and I want this and you want that and it's nothing but one argument after another. When you look at this, like you said, a symphony. This is this is uh, this is truly a good way to to put it. I mean, to make this stuff happen, you've got to have a different kind of a culture, and. They've obviously um, they've obviously figured it out over there, because <clears throat> the guy that has this job and that job is not the guy that's got this job or that job. So we're looking here at uh, people that have to work together, and I don't know how they blend them. I don't know how they make them together. I've never had the opportunity to go inside of uh, inside of the inner workings of, uh, of Tesla. So. But I'm I'm really impressed. Every time I see something, I'm 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 impressed. Do you think this might be backward compatible as well? Yeah, I, I would actually have to go and measure the footprint in the packaging space. But if you were, I, I suspect, unless they had a very strong reason to change it, that I'll call it a sacred footprint. So yeah, the, the hard points, points of the points. yeah the pickup points on the cradle. I would imagine that those are the same. I I saw roughly the same footprint on the front. Um, just in terms of uh, grossly where those points are. So I suspect mm. they're the same, but we would need to confirm. Um, it would be kind of cool if um, if you had, a, say, a rear end crash on an old Model 3 and you could, or sorry, um, Model S, and you could pull that out and put in a whole, near, a whole new rear module. All you have to do is just go straight into the four holes that are going to pick it up and, um, and locate it. That would be phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that's something that actually a lot of our clients, as you know, right, ask us for, hey, we've yeah. got this existing program. We don't want to build an all new one. Right. So how much can we maintain backwards compatibility right. with? And right. it's, uh, it's not easy, but if yeah. they've done it, yeah. kudos. Well, there's really not much to talk about here. We're going to be talking about the body later on. And um, all we talked about just now was the pickup points that, that would be these uh, tapped holes here yep. <clears throat> where the big bolts go through. So I think we're pretty much done here. Um, and maybe the, the only other thing that uh, underbody at this point until we actually get in the body is once again, the casting story continues, right? Yeah. So this, this rear section of the rail, which houses all four of the subframe mounting points that Sandy was just pointing out, 
Um, that was all a stamped rail section on the, the original Model S. So they've gone to, once again, a, a well done die casting and, yeah. um, you know, which isn't without its burdens. They're having to do some interesting things in terms of maintaining local joint stiffness, a lot of structural adhesive. So that's like this, this stamp steel reinforcement. With in, rivets. With rivets, right, because they're going from steel to aluminum yeah. and uh, extrusions, stampings, castings, all in one. But, um, you know, and it's hard to say if that's from durability or fatigue or uh, aiding in the fixture even. Yeah, until maybe. Um, mostly it looks to me like dissimilar materials that need to be, uh, you know, have a, well, we call them chicken rivets. It usually use them <clears throat> because you, the, the numbers show up on the, um, on the uh, FE, the finite element analysis, and now they, they comes back and it says, ah, it's okay. The engineer looks at it and says, you know, for 10 bucks, I can buy a bracket and uh, for a buck more or thereabouts, I can throw some rivets at it and I'll feel more comfortable that it's all gonna do its job, so. Yep. So anyway, um, we'll, be, uh, we'll be coming back to you. Thanks again, Jordan. And uh, Jordan will be probably showing up on uh, a lot more of this stuff because he was actually there and knows the difference between the two vehicles. So stay tuned. Uh, thank you for watching uh, Monroe and Monroe Live and uh, uh, we'll be talking to you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.